Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again. Ain't gonna hurt. Is my boomstick. Oh, game over, man. Game over. Welcome to the Barkin' Bin. He is your host, Ben Mason. And he is your co-host, Sandra Luketic. And today we're talking the March listener pick from Cody, 1979's Alien. We assume if you're listening to this episode, you have already seen the movie. See, you like that? I did it. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. It's almost like I've practiced it a few times. So, Alien. Yes, sir. We'll get into why Cody picked it, but what is your experience with this film? So I know I've seen this movie, but it was when I was a child. So it was like a fresh viewing because mostly I remembered the plot anecdotally, having conversations about the series and kind of recollecting things mm -hmm. from it, but not actually seeing the movie again since I was a child. I've seen later entries into the movie franchise, although not nearly all of them. I, I think only maybe two and three and maybe one of the ones that came after that. So it's sparse, to say the least. Okay. Um, I couldn't tell you the first time I saw this movie. Definitely a long time ago. I've seen it numerous times over the years. Uh, different versions, too, which kind of threw me for a loop uh, when watching the version that we'll be talking about today, which is just the theatrical version. Um, made me forget or thought I missed a few scenes that I really appreciated that were in the later cuts, but we'll cover that. So, full disclosure, I, uh, I watched the director's cut. Oh, okay. So. All right. So, okay, that, no, that's good. That's fine. <laughs> Maybe we should have discussed this ahead no, of time. That's, that's all good, because I'm going to mention a scene that I remember the most, which is one of my favorite moments that just wasn't in this version of the film, so I had to pick a different one. Oh, okay. But I, apparently it was in yours, so I'm curious to hear your take on it when we get there. <laughs> this isn't even one of my jokes about watching the wrong version. No. I just legitimately got the director's cut. Communication is key, apparently. Ah, we'll be fine. Uh, did you happen to notice who wrote the movie? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, Dan O'Bannon. I know that you probably think that that's supposed to stand out to me for some reason, but you know it doesn't. Well, he, going further back, he uh, co-directed a movie with my favorite director, who I assume you can just name easily. Starts with a J. Ends with an on carpenter. J. Jonah Jameson? Nailed it. <laughs> John Carpenter. <laughs> and, uh, yes. And it was also written by uh, Ronald uh, Shusett, or Shusett. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that last name. But Ronald wrote Above the Law and Total Recall, the screenplays. So we've definitely got some, some sci-fi experts here. And I think it, it really does show. Horror, mm, not so much. A lot of people consider this a horror film, but it is definitely just a sci-fi film with horror elements. I love that you're talking about the pedigree of like sci-fi and all that, and we haven't even said Ridley Scott. Go for it. You want to talk Ridley Scott? No, but just you know, talking about like oh, sci-fi royalty. Huh? It is pedigree for sure. He is sci-fi royalty. Yeah. So. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing that you can have that many people involved with it that you can actually talk up, like, the, the pedigree of people that are involved with this from a sci-fi standpoint and not even have to touch on Ridley Scott yet. Have we covered a Ridley Scott movie before? I don't believe so. No, I'm not sure. Huh. I'm going to look right now. <laughs> no, I'm seriously curious. We had to, right? Have to. I mean, we, we don't. There's a lot of movies to cover. No, 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 no we're good. Okay. All right. Legend. Thanks. He directed Legend with Tom Cruise. Uh, that's all we've covered. <laughs> that, that's that's kind of sad. I'd almost wish we left it at we didn't. Yeah. I mean, we're not ever talking Blade Runner on this show, so no one get your hopes up. Um, but yeah, I want to uh, say why, uh, why Cody picked alien for us okie dokie and he calls us out 
which I kind of dig. It, it's a short, sweet, one sentence. You guys have a clip from the second movie in your intro and yet have not reviewed an Aliens movie. Well, we'll have to talk to whoever made that intro. I give know, them right? A proper tongue lashing. We also haven't talked Roadhouse, which we should do soon, especially with the new one out now on Prime. We haven't talked mall rats, okay? I just picked a bunch of random quotes that I loved <laughs> at the time. I didn't know where we were going to go with the picks. Okay, well, yeah, it's true, but fine. Now we have to cover Roadhouse, Aliens, and mall rats. Honestly, I, I don't even remember what I put in that intro, so... <laughs> okay, fine. I think the only one we might have covered was Army of Darkness. I don't even know how many else there are in there, okay? Just back off, Cody. Just <laughs> back off. Thank you for your submission. <laughs> tagline, Sandra. The tagline for this movie is incredibly famous. In space, no one can hear you scream. Probably one of the best taglines of all time. I mean, if you're alone in space, if you're with someone... I guess if you're, if you're a member of a crew that has a total of seven people, there's six others that can hear you scream. Yeah, and, and like, you're in the ship, so the sound's gonna carry, but... It will echo. Does the cat count? Don't get me started on the cat, man. I got, I got thoughts on the cat. Not a fan of orange cats? I have no problem with cats, but that, we'll get into that, it. That cat gets fucked up in this movie, and no one says a thing about it. <laughs> Do you think this is the slowest opening credit sequence ever? Oh, well, we're not at the opening credit sequence yet, buddy. Fine, let's play your game. Yeah, I saw what you tried to do there. Um, two people? You got it! Uh, John Hurt, for sure. Correct. Because we saw him recreate a scene from this movie in Spaceballs. That is correct. And I'm pretty sure he was the voice of the villain in The Black Cauldron. Yes, the Horned King! Good yes, job! Yes, the Horned King. Is, was that it? Yep. Okay, sweet. Uh, Yafet Koto. Yep. The Running Man. 100%. It was only that movie, right? You, you just, you got 100%. For like the second time in 151 episodes? Well, you know, when you have a cast of seven people, it makes it a little bit easier. <laughs> That's true, actually. <laughs> I'll still take that as a win. There wasn't a lot of names to go through for this. <laughs> Which is good. I like, I, honestly, I really prefer films with a smaller cast. Makes for more intimate storytelling. I think it really depends on the film. You, you can really go either way with that. Yeah, but remember Coherence? That was fantastic. And that oh, was so good. Dinner but, party. Uh, but it depends on the movie. Well, name, name another one that had a small cast that wasn't good that we covered. Well, that we covered. That's not fair. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, go. I'll, I'll wait. Go for it. Just move on. You know what I mean in general, though. So, slowest opening credit sequence? Probably. Uh, a, a bit of a foreshadowing as to the pacing of this film? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do I need to say this right now? I thought I could hold it back a little bit longer. No, go for it. I know it's been bugging you, so you may as well just get it out. This movie might be the king of slow burns. Yeah, it, I think there so. There are so many scenes of nothing for so long. I, I think that's intentional, though, because of the way that the film ends. Yes, they are absolutely building suspense and things like that, but... And, okay, you know, I, I try to put myself into a bit more of an a open mind when I'm watching these. It's 1979. Expectations, movie viewership, just everything would have been different. Yeah. But, my God, is this slow! <laughs> Keep in mind, this is also like two years after Star Wars came out, so Star Wars isn't slow at all. Like, you don't need slow storytelling, but it was a creative decision for sure. I think they just went a little overboard here. They absolutely did, because there are quite a few examples of times where they've used slow scenes, we'll call them, to build suspense, to build intrigue, and you get that effect. But then they carry it on like a Saturday Night Live sketch that goes on way too long. Yeah, it just kind of loses the impact eventually. Yeah, like you've, you've already done what you set out to do. You've built suspense. I'm on the edge of my seat. 
I'm ready for a jump scare or something like uh, just something. And then you continue to do nothing for even longer. And it's like, okay, cut this down a little bit. This is a film that uses the cat jump scare twice. Like it, it definitely overuses the same thing time and time again. Well, what else are they going to use? They're on a spaceship. There's nothing you, else going on around them. There's only one alien. Yeah. What else are you going to do? You got to use some sort of scares. Maybe a burst pipe, but the cat makes sense. But you don't need multiple jump scares in a film. We get at least three. Two with the cat and one with the xenomorph doing jazz hands. Okay. Yeah. Cut like 30 minutes out of the movie. Get rid of the second cat jump scare. Two is fine. But the thing is, you're drawing out the silences and what I, the some scenes, and it's not silence that makes it creepy. It is the amazing sound design. Because I don't know if you listened with headphones on when you were watching this film, but if anybody's listening and hasn't seen it, or they have seen the movie and really enjoy it, watch it again with a decent pair of headphones. It is much more effective. Okay, but if it's going to be this long and you take out the jump scares, what are you going to be left with? A movie that you have to watch at 1.25 speed? Yeah, like, come on. So, we get a bit of an info breakdown about the ship that we spend the movie on, the Nostromo. Oh, right. We're talking about a movie. <laughs> it's a commercial towing vehicle, seven crew, carrying mineral ore back to Earth. Thoughts on the visual effects here and the sets? Why is this ship so big? I don't know. Like, it's I, a towing ship. I get that. I mean, it can be bigger so that it can tow other things, but it's like the boats. size of a city. Apparently, they had, uh, they, they truncated that because they had a shot of what it was towing to make it look like it was over a mile long. Don't really need that. And they, they, they agreed and, and cut it. So if, if only they would cut more. Mm -hmm. I like the shots in space. I thought they looked pretty good. Yeah, you know what? For 1979, this looks really good. Yeah, like the, the ship looks decrepit. Uh, it, yeah, not, not bad. But again, even this is too drawn out. Kind of like what they're making fun of in Spaceballs. And what we yeah. saw done really well in Star Wars. The sound design I thought absolutely amazing. Uh, just the sounds the, com the computers make when they're turning on. Uh, really helps setting the scene for the rest of the film because... This is the dirtiest, junkiest, oldest spaceship I feel we've seen in a sci-fi movie that we've covered. And I think that really helps set the tone for the entire film. Well, I don't know how many other movies we did where we saw spaceships to compare their junkiness, but sure. I do want to touch back on what you had said about sound design, though. Yeah. Because, like the computers booting up, there are so many sound effects that have just become kind of unanimous with this series. Mm -hmm. I know recently I do a game night with uh, Josh and Alex from Pixel Opinions. And just before it, this movie was announced as the one we were doing, we actually started playing Aliens Fireteam Elite, right? It's like a Left 4 Dead game done in the Alien universe. Amazing. And like, I remember the first time we booted it up and I fired a rifle immediately that sound effect was enough to put me into the alien like mindset because it's so hand in hand so like the the pulse rifle from mm -hmm. uh, from the sequel from aliens mm -hmm. yeah hmm. but there's a lot of them like when you interact with a door when you interact with a computer like they have created their own sound effects that have become like widespread known and associated with this franchise and it's so wonderfully done I love all of it. What I don't love really is the crew. Um, they awaken from uh, stasis. Apparently, you have to wear minimal amounts of clothing. Not really sure why. What do you think is a crew? I'll, I'll, I'll run through who they are. We have the captain, Dallas, played by Tom Skerritt. Okay. <laughs> I got so many uh kurt russell the thing vibes from this guy especially when he's off on his own in the uh, mother room yeah listening to classical music yeah it just made me think of kurt russell in his tower playing chess with his computer you got the beard you got the 
kind of preference to a bit of solitude, like quiet protagonist. I I got that vibe. I don't know about you, but it, it felt very strong in this. Oh, definitely it did. I kind of wish he was more crucial to the story because he just kind of pops in and out of importance. Oh, they're very, very different characters. Like Kurt Russell's character gave a damn. <laughs> this guy seems like he can't be bothered for most of the stuff that's going on around him. Well, Kurt Russell's just amazing in everything, too. He makes the characters fantastic. Uh, we have Executive Officer Kane, played by John Hurt. I like Kane. I do, too, but this is unfortunately a character that we really don't spend much time with outside of him comatose with an alien on his face. Yeah. So there really isn't much you can garner good or bad from this character. But he also kind of seems like an idiot, doesn't he? If we want to boil it down, they kind of all seem like idiots at different times. They really do, when it's convenient to the plot, like him tripping and falling into the nest of eggs. Like, this is a towing crew. We got to keep in mind, they're not the scientists, right? Like, this is outside of the plant that we find out is amongst their team. They're just a towing crew. They're intelligent in what they do, right? You're going to have the repair technicians, but they're not meant to be charismatic. They're not meant to be diplomatic. They're just a towing crew. Which leads me to Ripley, played by Sigourney Weaver, who's a, a warrant officer. So she is a ranking member of the military. What is she doing on this ship? Yeah, see, I was kind of curious about that. I would have understood if they had kind of played it up. I don't know how you would have found the runtime in this lengthy movie to go into a backstory that perhaps she, like, lost her military rank and as just an alternative got a job as a security member for this, like, great. company. Then yeah. it's like, okay, she has the expertise and a reason to be here. Yeah, that would make so much more sense. But they didn't have enough time to work with in this movie to actually establish these characters. Lambert, the navigator, played by Veronica Cartwright. <clears throat> I hate this character. How can you not? So I don't want to say more about it. Okay. Hint, hint, possible award. But I hate uh, this character. Chief Engineer Parker, played by Yafet Koto. I love this guy. <laughs> He's great. <laughs> Especially paired up with engineering technician Brett, played by Harry Dean Stanton. They these get two, along so well. Yeah, it, the chemistry between these two is amazing. And then finally, the science officer, Ash, played by Ian Holm. Right from the start, you're like, this guy's not, not a good guy. No, well, right from the start, you're like, this guy's just a dick. <laughs> yep. <laughs> My question here is, do you think it would be better if we had a crew of eight so we'd have someone to take care of the food? <laughs> oh, a, a cook? Yeah. That might make sense, but I don't think it matters. It doesn't. But the camaraderie around the dinner table is fantastic. Uh, as you've already stated and I've agreed with you, most of these characters are idiots, but what a great way of building character relations for the viewer. Now, I, I really want to know your thoughts on the computer, who we all know as Mother. Does it need to have a voice? No. Yeah. I'm, I'm lost. Really I'm, yeah, no, I know. I, I, I'm right there with you. I'm curious to know why they made that choice. Just trying to be futuristic, I guess? I think so. Like, it would be fine if, if it was just a voice or just text. Because we see later on when they are actually interacting with Mother and asking questions, it responds in text. Yes. Why can't it, if you're establishing a voice for it as like a sentient AI, just have it answer verbally? Couldn't tell you. Right? One or the other. Right? It's a question I had as well. Again, doesn't really matter. Why do you find that in a lot of science fiction films, the sets like... When, when you're in like the, at the helm of a ship or something, th there's just thousands of blinking lights. Uh, I think it is just to make it look futuristic. Because practically speaking, even in sci-fi, there, there's never going to be a need for that. No, it's incredibly overwhelming. And I fully believe from how we've seen these characters interact, none of them know what all of those lights do. 
Well, yeah, because I feel like one thing that they are missing, although maybe it's supposed to be Ash, is someone who can actually do the electronic stuff. But I guess the technicians are just meant to repair, like, kind of everything. They're like your, your coverall. I guess. I don't know. The, the, the more we cover this, the more holes I'm finding in its structure. But we're good at that, I've noticed. Yeah, well, what are you going to do? So they've woken up in a different solar system. Okay, right away, decent plot element. Um, but then the seriousness of that is sidetracked by the bickering between Brett and Parker, which is wonderful, just weirdly out of place. I get really strong Palmer vibes from Brett. Palmer? Yeah, from the thing. Am I doing too many comparisons oh, yes. here? No, 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 that's fine. Okay. But Palmer, really? Why is that? I don't know. It's just this personality. Like, it's a very jovialist character goofing around. Not taking too many things seriously. I think wasn't Palmer like the pilot or something like that there? Like just kind of they're believe. they're they're perfect like every men on the these guy in the, the guy in the background who pipes up when he needs to. Yeah. It works. Well, because you, you gotta understand that there's gonna be like everyday people that are just, say, a technician on this crew and not just proficient fighters and scientists. Like there's gonna be relatable people that are there for a specific trade which is as valuable as any other yeah and like definitely i think he's there more so for the uh, audience than the actual purpose of being there for the job dallas lets us know that mother got an sos transmission and changed course i find that absolutely horrifying knowing that like you go into stasis because you're heading back home and you wake up completely off course but you're a towing company. Yeah. Which also doesn't make any sense when you get later into the film with like that weird twist. Like, I guess you should anticipate being interrupted to tow things. Okay. Let's just cut to the chase. Yeah. The whole point of sending them to this planet was to secure an ALF. <laughs> so we were chatting about before recording <laughs> alien life form yep. as a specimen to bring back to earth for study yes they seem to know that it's insanely dangerous and practically unkillable why not send you know a team of people like soldiers with maybe a couple random average joes to use as hosts and do it that way. Uh, to be crass, I think that without any further knowledge on it, you send the most expendable people so that at, at worst it can be recon. Makes sense. Do you think that's why they sent an Android replacement for the uh, science officer? Of course. You don't want to risk anybody that you actually hold of value. Yes. So, like this entire crew. Or guinea pigs. See, I think, well, yes, they are. But I think they sent the android because it can't get infected. Oh, I didn't even think about that. I just thought the android's not going to need to go into stasis and they can be the one that sets up the emergency wake up for this whole thing. Like, it can set this yeah. whole thing into motion. Exactly. But it will not, it cannot become an incubator for a xenomorph okay but if if Thus, that's your if that's your rationale send an entire crew of them well the thing is they need one of them to be the host to give birth to the xenomorph otherwise the face huggers aren't going to do shit so somebody has to die to create the xenomorph that's what i'm saying send a bunch of soldiers and then like random host bodies it is interesting though it's very interesting they say that any sense of intelligence must require investigation. Like you said, these people aren't qualified to investigate anything. They are basically space truckers. Yes. But they'll forfeit everything, like all of their wages, everything they've earned, if they don't help. Doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, right? Because, because you're a towing vessel. You would imagine that your pay comes from towing things. Well, that would make sense. And 
I can't imagine you apply for this job. And they're like, yeah, if you don't go on rescue missions as well, you just don't get paid to tow stuff. Now, is that why they have Ripley in case something like this happens? And if so, make that point known. <sighs> Honestly, if I'm going to play like devil's advocate to what you said earlier, I'm going to send an entire team of androids and one human. That works too. So they land on planet LV-426, except apparently nobody knows how to properly land the goddamn ship and it, it's damaged. Okay, well, let me ask you real quick. We went through the crew. Which one of them's a pilot? <laughs> Do we have the captain? Let's assume, let's assume he can. All right, okay. Well, we will have to assume because that's all we got. We, well, we do get more Brett and Parker. Love that. But do you get the feeling that Dallas, you already compared him to, um, um, oh my God, why am I forgetting Kurt Russell's name in the thing? I don't know. I just go with Kurt Russell. <laughs> okay. It feels like here he's kind of a Han Solo character. No, Han Solo cared about stuff, even if it was himself. Well, Dallas also cares, kind of, but he's super brash, and he's like, he's the rogue of the team. See, I got the impression so many times that he was just, like, throwing his hands up most of the time. He's like, oh, that's what the company says, just do whatever. Like, he yeah. just didn't care. Yeah, he does not, roll Not that he didn't easily. care, but that, like, he wasn't going to get involved. It's like, just do what we're told, whatever. Next up, we get a really short scene where Ash psychs himself up before people leave the ship. Why? Well, because he knows that things are about to go down. Why would an android need to psych himself up and, like, jump up and down and, like, pump their arms? With the later <sighs> reveal, it makes no sense. But I guess we're not supposed to know he's an android yet, so they deliberately make us think he's just a human being, a regular human. But then when you rewatch this, you're like, well, that's just really fucking cheap. <laughs> it's a really cheap misdirect. Yeah. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with chopping up as that one time. Fine. The movie is trying to misdirect us. Yeah. And I mean, they're doing it for a reason. I get it. At the time, I don't think anybody expected this to like, hit a home video platform by any means. Um, stereotypical exploring an alien planet scene. Not a whole lot to say here. It looks fine. Um, traversing the harsh environment. This is where Kane, Dallas, and Lambert find the down ship. Um, are these the three people you would send? <laughs> Who else are you going to send? <laughs> Not the fucking captain or navigator. If anything happens to them, you're stuck. Well, the, the captain has to lead by example. Uh, navigator, I don't know. Navigate herself out of this movie. That's what she should be doing. <laughs> what do you think of the uh, the look of the spaceship they find, like the giant boomerang? That's fine. I mean, I hate it. For a lot of these designs, you just have to imagine it's 1970s. They're trying to think outside the box to make things that look futuristic and out of worldly, and and it's fine. Yeah, I mean, we do have to touch on the fact that, you know, who designed all of this stuff. Uh, depending on you're talking to, it's H.R. Geiger or Giger, um, master of biomechanical art. It's all slimy, gooey, and disturbing. It, great artist. Weird, weird, tiny human being. Um, Discovery of the pilot, I really enjoyed. The, uh, the space jockey, as he's known. No, I didn't know that's what he was known as. Yeah, in, in lore when you're talking about it, uh, he is the space jockey. Eventually, we come to know them as the engineers. But uh, this is a massive alien with a hole in his chest. Uh, absolutely love the design. But we cut back to the ship, to the Nostromo, or I guess the uh, shuttle or whatever. Ripley discovers that the message they received wasn't an SOS, but more of a warning. Why? And gets, I don't know. Like, if this was all set up, Block why the would they even get a warning? Well, I think the warning was coming from the downed ship. Because they, they had to work on deciphering the language. That makes sense. Uh, some foreshadowing where Ripley wants to let the team know, but Ash basically says they'll find out for themselves when they get there if, if they need to be warned. I'm like, okay, so this guy really is a villain. 
Yeah, you're not even going to like run with this one for much longer. It, it's right from there. You're like, okay, how involved are you in this? I'm going to say almost entirely. Completely. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Kane descends into the ship and finds that nest of eggs and just falls right into it. Just, just trips. The eggs look amazing. But they do. They really do. Here we get the reveal of the face huggers as one bursts out of a, an egg sack I'm and sorry. attaches itself to Kane's face. Listen, Kane, you're, you're an idiot. Yeah. If I was in this scenario and one of those eggs even remotely started to open, I'm not leaning my face towards it. I'm running out of there. Well, when no. you see the thing moving through the side of it, that's when you back off. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not waiting to find out what is actually coming out of that thing. Whatever it is, it ain't the crew that I'm coming to save. No. <laughs> it's, it is horrifying, though. And the sound design, again, takes the foreground. And it really works to make the scene effective. Dallas and Lambert drag Kane back to the ship, where Ripley does her best to follow protocol, demanding they wait the 24-hour quarantine period for de decontamination. And Ash just lets them in. Yeah, Ash is just garbage. I thought it was actually really funny. Not supposed to be, but I was laughing at it. I do like how he attempts to feign concern. Right? Like his whole rationale for letting them in is that he doesn't want Cain to be harmed. And he was also following orders. But later on, you're like, oh, he didn't care about him. He just wanted to get the, the face hugger in there. Yeah. And okay, perfect. So we've got Cain on the examination table now. What do you think of the face hugger? I, I believe it's more terrifying than the xenomorph. It's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty threatening. Yeah. It, it's got its tail wrapped around his neck, and you just see as they're trying to do anything, it's just squeezing tighter and tighter. And, and then they try to cut it open, and it bleeds acid, and you're like, well, he's done. If that yeah. thing doesn't let go, he's done. Yeah. Did, did you read the trivia about why they bleed acid? No. Apparently, O'Bannon couldn't come up with a decent reason why the crew wouldn't just shoot the thing to death. <laughs> because then your movie's over. So once you give them a reason to avoid inflicting damage, the alien becomes that much more terrifying. Because not only is it hunting you, but killing it is incredibly dangerous to yourself. I mean, this movie would have been over as well if they had just left Kane there. Which, honestly, probably should have done. But they weren't even in the room with him. What if he no. got attached, like, by the face hugger, and they never stumbled upon him? The, uh, uh, that, would be, that would be absolutely hilarious if that was the case. Where's Kane? I don't know. Let's leave. Sure. Ripley confronts Ash about Kane and the alien. Um, I missed this every viewing until my rewatch this morning. I find it really interesting that the alien is making Kane's body more resistant to harsh environmental elements. So it's like shedding skin and replacing it with something a little bit more durable. Great survival technique. But when they check in on Kane later and the alien's just gone, the last thing you do is go into the room with no protection. It, it really is a ship full of idiots. Yes. <laughs> You've seen what this thing does. Why are you even in, like stand behind the glass? What are you doing? That's just it. If they sent an intelligent crew, many of the things that we just said might have happened. But even Ripley, the smart one, follows them in. No, not necessarily the smart one. The one that's smart in regards to military tactics. I guess, and orders. Right? We can't just assume because you're good at one thing that you're good at everything. I don't know. She seems pretty good at everything from this point on. Well, most of what's left from this point on is making military decisions and defense True. decisions. Oh, I forgot to mention we do get another jump scare here where the, uh, the dead face hugger falls out of the vents onto Ripley. Uh, didn't like this one that much. Me neither. J just what? because it looked so flimsy when it landed on her, and it's just like it's flopping around as she knocks it off her. I'm like, yeah. well... It like, if, if that was, like, one of its set of skin that it shed, I would have believed it, because, it's like, well, that thing doesn't look like it has any life in it at all. What, what do you think about, like, we'll talk some effects here. Um, some of them are amazing, and some of them are piss poor. 
and I, I have to say, when they, um, after attacking Ash later in the movie, and they like they bring him back online, when they're setting up his head on the on the table, did you notice how bad that was? <laughs> they're just setting it up so that his head is oh, well, like, through a hole in the table. Yeah, for one shot, it's obviously a really poorly made up mannequin head that they're just like pushing on the table. Then it cuts away to, I think, one of the faces and cuts back. And it's just Ian Holmes' head through a table. Yeah. It looks completely different. And that really takes you out of the movie. <sighs> they're making do with what they got. I mean, in 1979, probably would have blown us away. Probably. I already mentioned this, but here's the reveal that the regular science officer who has followed Dallas on the last five jobs was replaced two days before the mission with Ash. So yeah, now like there's not, I don't even know why we're continuing with this. And again, Dallas just doesn't care. No, he's pretty passive. You're right. I, I, I missed a lot of this. Well, I, I, I get it. There might be a point where he's like, it, you know, obviously if I say something, the company this, the company that, but like he doesn't even ask questions. They replaced him. Why? I don't know. No. Like, he didn't even ask. Did you think that they had already left the planet at this point? Uh, yes. Yeah. But I just, it's because I was focused on all of this stuff with Kane. Yeah. That I, I didn't actually go back to think, oh, did they finish the repairs to get out of there? Yeah, not really referenced. I assumed that this had happened a long time ago, the ship taking off. But they're doing it now, and then we learn there's a 10-month journey to Earth. And Kane's up and around now. Doesn't one of them suggest when the facehugger is still on Kane to just freeze them like that? Yes. It was uh, Parker. Yeah, and then isn't it Ash that's like, no? Yeah. So, yeah, just another villainous moment for me. <laughs> so with Kane up and around, we may as well all go into the room and hang out with him. Because that seems super safe and smart. No one asks questions. No one. It's like, this thing was attached to your head. It was not letting go. We tried cutting it, and it bled acid through multiple floors of our ship. It forced something down your throat and was feeding you air, changing the molecular construction of your body. I think one person, it might have been Ash, says, do you remember anything? And he, he remembers having a dream of being suffocated. And nobody asks... Well, why did this thing maybe let go now? Yeah. Nobody says a thing. It's just, well, whatever, it's time for dinner. Well, the, the dinner thing was more just like they were ready to go back into frozen state, and they were like, well, we should just eat before we do. Yeah. Undoubtedly one of the most iconic scenes ever in a film. Yeah, I liked it better in Spaceballs. Really? I don't know, the chest-bursting scene at the table is so good. I don't like how the xenomorph looks when it comes out of his chest. Might be because <laughs> I'm watching a 1979 practical effect in 2024. But at least in Spaceballs, it was meant to be comedic and not look good. It looks horrible in this movie. When it scurries away, it literally is like, just like they're sliding it across the floor, not even trying to make it look like it's taking strides. No, it's, it's like bad. it's being pulled along a track. Yeah, it's... Not good. So I've read a few different things about this scene. Um, one that I believe for a really long time is that only Ridley Scott and John Hurt knew that that was going to happen, that like, the chest bursting scene would happen. Oh, to get some genuine reactions from the other people? Yeah. Uh, and a conflicting story where they had to film it twice because the first time it didn't burst through the shirt. And that's why it shows him after he, like, clutches his chest and starts shaking. And then there's that blood splatter. He just falls back and his shirt is just covered in blood. It hasn't ripped or anything. And then the alien bursts out. I, I read that that was left in because it really tried to show that the alien was ripping its way through Kane's chest and was having a tough time, like, birthing itself, basically. I think that's pretty effective. Hmm. No, it's interesting. I don't think it really changes much in regards to the movie, but it is still interesting. 
No, when you're just like an analysis of a scene. Do you notice that they do the most half-assed attempt at finding the alien than just jettison Kane's body off in space? Yeah. They're not smart. They are so dumb that I feel we're misled in how long most of these people survive this film. They don't really, though. None of Once them... Once the xenomorph is fully grown, they don't last long. They do, though. Who dies, who dies in this movie? Well, all of them. No. Well, eventually, yeah. But who dies because of an alien in this movie? Oh, uh, Parker, Lambert, Kane, uh, Dallas. Uh, Dallas and uh, Lambert aren't, uh, aren't dead until the ship blows up. Really? So you didn't watch the director's cut. It was listed as the director's cut. Because in that... Well, maybe it's just the 25th anniversary version then. In that, as Ripley's like running away, she finds Park. Was it Parker? No, it is Lambert and Dallas cocoon to the wall because they're going to be hosts eventually. Oh, and, okay. And Dallas pleads for Ripley to kill him. Huh. It's really dark. That is pretty dark. And one of my favorite, favorite scenes. And I thought I just missed it in the movie. Well, now I don't know what version I watched. <laughs> Brett produces a small cattle prod, space cattle prod, and Ash has something that senses change in micro density in the air. I mean, it makes sense for the movie. Uh, it's just a device to create tension with its beeping. It's an iconic sound effect, though. It is. It really is. I, just to go back to the video game again, you do have a little radar in your corner, and it starts beeping when there's xenomorphs coming at you. It's pretty true to it. It feels so alien. Oh. I, I mean that as in, like, it feels oh, so on brand, right? Like, yes. No, I got you. Double entendre. Dallas's plan is pretty much the only thing you could do. I don't know why he's the only one that thinks of it. And that's to catch the alien and put it in the airlock. I mean, what else are you going to do? You, you obviously can't kill it, or at no. least you don't know if you can kill it. You might be able to, but I don't think that's the kind of thing that you want to risk. Is oh, I'm standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with this thing, and I might make it. It might not. Yeah, I mean, and We've already thing... learned that the facehugger is developing all these resistances, so what is this? And actually, at this point, they don't even know what the xenomorph looks like beyond the little thing that burst out of the chest, so they, they don't even know what they're looking for. But we have to assume that they know, or at least assume that this thing also has acid blood, right? That's what I would assume. Why would the blood change? Yeah, with the tiny cut from the face hugger, it almost went through the hull of the ship. Oh, maybe that's why they're going to this cattle prod thing. Because they're like, we can't kill it. We can't risk it destroying our ship. But maybe we can stun... Yeah, that's, that's what, uh, what Brett says. It's like, it, it shouldn't break the skin, but it'll give it a nasty shock. Oh, that makes a lot more sense now. But they rarely use it in the movie. <laughs> I didn't say that they follow through, but it's a good <laughs> idea. Like, one of them had a good idea. Let's give them credit for that. First cat jump scare. But at least it serves a purpose here, which most don't. And that is um, Parker and Lambert. Is it Lambert or Ripley? They basically scold Brett for letting the cat get away because now it will show up on the, the sensor as well. And they're just looking for the alien. Yeah, because the sensor is only detecting movement, really. Yeah. So it's a great way to separate Brett from Parker and Ripley because since he let the cat go, he has to go find it. Why do you have a cat? I don't know. You need a cat. Everyone needs a cat. On a towing vessel where you're going to be cryogenically frozen for 10 months at a time? You need to have a cat? I would like to have a cat. Okay. So Brett finds shed skin from the alien and just picks it up with his bare hands. <laughs> He's not smart. But he did produce the cattle prod, which was smart. Okay, I'm going to say right now, this is not a good movie. Okay. I don't mind the long drawn out bits of the film. Okay. But I wonder if we actually took the time to remove some of them, how much that would 
cut down the runtime. This movie's already too long. Oh, it's anyway, definitely too long. The xenomorph appears and kills Brett, we think. Or we're led to believe, depending on which version of the movie you've seen. Well, I believe that part of that is also done intentionally to hide the shortcomings in the like the technical side of it, because could be the alien does look cool for sure. But if you actually analyze its time on screen, its actual movements that we can see are fairly limited, and it's probably because they don't have the means to make it look seamless. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the movie didn't exactly have a large budget, so try and hide everything. So, you know, hide, hide the potential flaws. Yeah, and I'm okay with that. I think that they did a really good job hiding what probably would have been inadequacies with the actual movement and look of the alien. You keep it a little bit more still and mo like immobile, and you can get those mm -hmm. cooler looks. Oh, and that's right. I think this it almost abducts Brett, and it's Brett and Dallas on the wall, I think. That's what it was. Because you don't see Dallas die either. No, Dallas, you see nothing. Yeah, just jazz hands. I think with Brett, you even hear screams, but I mean, that could also be them being dragged away too. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Well, it's time for a team huddle. Let's discuss. How is the thing so big? How do they know it's so big? That's what I was going to ask you. Because Brett saw it, but I don't think he had a chance to relay that information to them. No. Ash refers to it as Kane's son, which I found very unnerving. I didn't even catch that. <laughs> yeah, he just whispers it in the background. I was like, dude. So what do we do? Cat and mouse it. I, I, I would not be going into those air vents. Those I'm sorry. Tunnels. If I'm in their shoes, I have to believe that my mentality would be like, uh, when I think it's Dallas says it, like, animals flee from fire, don't they? Be like, maybe not this one. Yeah. <laughs> I have no reason to believe that this one would. Before, before we get to that, though, Dallas is at the computer, and I find this hilarious, because he's basically trying to Google what to do. Yeah, and the, com and the computer's <laughs> like, nope, <laughs> does not compute. <laughs> it really does make him look like he's... We already know he looks like an idiot, and that he rolls over very easily. But if this is his go-to, we're in a lot of trouble. Yep. But yes, Dallas in the air vents with the flamethrower. Do you find it effectively scary? I think that this might have been the best scenes for suspense and anticipation in the movie, especially when Lambert starts to see the movement on the, yeah. on the tracker. But Dallas doesn't see anything that correlates with it because this thing could be crawling outside of the, the vents, inside the vents, on the ceilings. It just really, really adds a lot of tension to it. Honestly, as silly as it sounds, when you see the little beep moving on the radar mm -hmm. and Dallas on the comm saying that he doesn't see anything, that was like maybe the single most like suspenseful part of the movie. Yeah, it is without a doubt the most tense scene this film can deliver. And I think that's why it's been mimicked so much. It's spoofed all the time. But yeah, the reveal of the xenomorph with the jazz hands looks horrible. <laughs> it just don't have the hands there. If it was yeah. just the mouth open and the thing, I don't know what you would call it, sound hissing yeah. at him, good enough. Perfect. That would be terrifying. But I do enjoy how it just abducts him when you find out, like in the other version, that he's cocooned to the wall. Because that makes this not just a standard monster movie where the thing kills everyone. It adds a layer of mystery. Why are they doing this? What's going on? Well, there's talk about how these things are... Ash talks about their purity and that they're just survival, right? Yes. I think, I think this is when it's the dislocated, or the dismembered head. Yeah. And you think about it, it's like, yeah, just killing this crew wouldn't be survival. Exactly. Survival is cultivating the race. Need to procreate. Yes. So like, some of this stuff is really well written. It is. Uh, specifically, the scenes between Ripley and Ash. I would like to see more of it because they full on hate each other, which I find hilarious because Ash is a robot. 
but I think seeing more dissent between the crew would make things more tense than the drawn out silences that we keep getting. I don't think Ash hates Ripley. I think he sees her as a major threat. Yes. I think he just views it as an obstacle. If we were to take emotion out of what would be an android's response, it's more just, you are a nuisance for what I am trying to do. But it's, it is a form of aggression, which it seems almost overly human. Well, we've had some issues with that already. Yeah. Uh, and then we get the big twist of the film, um, which we've already kind of covered, but... Do you want to talk about what the, the twist is? So Ash is, uh, is it fair to say Android? Um, yes. Yeah. Ash is an Android that was clearly put with the crew when this science medical exchange happened that Dallas didn't care about in order to set up the crew to guide them to the ship to actually retrieve these specimens and bring them back. Most likely using an Android because one, they can't be harvested or or incubated mm -hmm. but also that they can remove emotional response from the idea of sacrificing these people yeah ha having the uh the the text pop up on screen that the crew is expendable seems kind of weird because you kind of want that crew to be infected or impregnated but this leads us to the ash and ripley fight where he just beats the shit out of her well, yeah, he's an android. <laughs> She's unarmed. But what, like, can you explain the rolled up magazine? <sighs> no. Yeah. I think he was just trying to use it to cause her to choke. I, right? Like even push down her own tongue into her throat. I guess. But you could just, he could just choke her. He throws her around with one hand. It's just a weird choice. I, I do like when he just picks her up with one hand and hucks her into the side of the door. <laughs> Right? It looks hilarious, but maybe not in the same way they were intending. I found it hilarious. The rest of the crew arrives. Ash does the iron claw to Parker's chest, and he just clubs Ash in the head with a weird canister of some sort. I think it was like a fire extinguisher type thing, sort of looked yeah. like to me, but it's futuristic. It doesn't matter. Ian Holm does a great job of flailing around here and making it scary. I don't know what it is. But everyone backs away, and even I kind of reared back a bit from the screen. Like, it's, it is very unnerving. Then he takes another shot to the head, and just the head almost completely falls off. And this is the android reveal. Okay, so we know it's an android, right? Yeah. We didn't need the reveal because we saw it sweating white stuff earlier. Yeah, you know, it's, you know Ash isn't human. But when he walks into that room, why is he sweating like oil or whatever it is, the white stuff? No idea. Like, <laughs> and it's, nev it's never explained. They never even try to explain it. <laughs> it's just an android just, leaking. Yeah. And no, no one seems to notice that. It's, uh, I don't know. Ripley deduces the company sent Ash to bring back the alien so they could use it in their weapons division. How would, how would she know that? It's pretty specific without any actual reason to believe it. It's capture a specimen, bring it back. Well, see, and this is where, this would be where if she was like a, 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 like a former military person and had seen the corruption of the military, could deduce that because like, well, this is the type of evil shit that led me to leave or something like that, right? Honestly, my go-to would be like, they, they know that this is a killing machine. They don't want to be surprised by it just showing up on Earth. So bring one back and we can figure out a way that we can kill it easily. Mm, predators. Yes, exactly. Mm, problem solved. In, in pyramids in the Arctic. No, don't get me started on that. Question for you, though. Okay. How does the company know what these aliens are? I don't know, dude. How do they know anything? Unless, I guess maybe, maybe they got the warning signal as well and were able to decipher it and maybe the explanation of what the aliens are is in that. But if that's the case, let us know. That was my idea is that you could essentially use that as a coverall to just say that they got the footage from that facility. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, we can deduce that ourselves as well. Yeah, that's, that's all I got. But in a movie that hand feeds you everything to its own detriment, that's a pretty important piece of information that would make this make a lot more sense. Because even, even Ash, Ash seemed to have almost no knowledge about the facehugger. Did he have no knowledge of it, or did he just not display his previous knowledge and he was just using that as a building off point to keep going with? I don't know. It, maybe it's also that he knows or they knew that the facehuggers were a thing because of the message that the space jockey sent, but he was actually just trying to study it now. Yes. He, yeah. So, so like and you're, it, and it, you're aware of them. Right? Like you know about them, but you don't know that they bleed acid, for example. Yeah. So you're using a little bit of information that you had as a, as a launching off point to do the rest of your deductions. Yeah. And I, I swear to God, any alien aficionado listening to this is like, these guys fucking suck. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, we're just trying to work with what we got here. Yeah. Thanks for sticking, on, sticking with us as long as you did. But next up, Parker torches Ash. Now, I don't know if setting fire to a room on a spaceship is the smartest move, especially since Ash isn't going anywhere. It's a little vindictive, but he is the engineer. He probably knows that it's okay. I guess. A classic sci-fi alien movie trope, trying to flee in an escape pod and blow up the ship. Okay, it's 79. We've seen it a lot since then. I don't know how many times we've seen it before that. But immediately another trope. Go back for the animal. Jonesy. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. All right. So I have a couple problems with this whole escape pod thing. Oh, please do tell. So the first one is just that, and we saw this earlier. We didn't talk about it. But the first mention of the escape pod was that it wouldn't hold enough of them. Right? It could only hold three. Now that we're down to three, it's sufficient. Fine. Right? If you are in a flying, towing, whatever thing in space, and you know you have a crew of more than three people, why would you not have more than one of these escape pods? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Just a small nitpick. But then my next one is a stupid cat, okay? And I shouldn't call it stupid. It's not the cat's fault. It's there. Why do you have a cat on the ship? And why are you going back for it? I'm not saying I want animals to be, be harmed, but if it's the cat or me? I'm sorry. I'm picking me. Yeah, well, you're also not a cat person. I don't want harm to animals, but there's a giant xenomorph. <laughs> if I'm already on the ship, I'm not braving it. Yeah, I mean, you've been through a lot. I would probably also just leave the cat. But Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying harm animals, but, like, this is a very out-of-the-ordinary situation where you're just like, hmm. If I have to pick between me and the cat, and there's this giant xenomorph, why? Fair point. It also makes me think, you're talking about uh, basically a lifeboat. I feel like there was a time, way, way back, now it's mandatory, you have to have enough lifeboats on, say, a cruise ship to, uh, to uh, house every passenger. But I feel like that wasn't always the case. You now, just have to get the main ones, the highest ranking ones. Yes. but. This is a science fiction film. We're dealing with spaceships. Yes, maybe it only holds three people that have multiple escape pods. It's like, if I'm not going into outer space if I don't have any sort of contingency. Yeah. We also get a second cat jump scare, which we don't need. Well, you did it to yourself. If you didn't go back for the cat, it wouldn't scare you like that. What are your thoughts on Parker and Lambert's death scene? Well, for Parker, good. Or, no, sorry, for Lambert, good. <laughs> yeah. For Lambert, good. But I hate her so much because she's the cause of Parker. He's like, yes. get out of the way. Get out of the way. And she just stands there. And it's like, all right, you're that whiny character whose inactivity is going to get yourself and someone else killed. Yeah, it is incredibly frustrating. And, yeah, I, I found her just standing there frozen in fear very annoying. Parker's yelling at her to get out of the way. At the same time, I'm thinking, why don't you just move, Parker? <laughs> Change your angle. Because <laughs> he's doing the exact same thing. Whatever. <laughs> I'm blaming her, not him. <laughs> A decent view of the Xenomorph, finally. So Ripley initiates that self-destruct sequence. 
but the alien's blocking her path to the pod, so it's time to override the self-destruct. Uh, missing the time limit to do so is pretty good. <sighs> sure. But now the whole end segment we get here, it does absolutely nothing for me. I, I'm very much of the belief that if I was ever in a position to build an, uh, a spacecraft, I'm putting the self-destruct sequence near the escape pod. Because there's no reason that I wouldn't have these two near each other. I would also give yourself more than one way to get to the escape pod. Even still. <laughs> Maybe a second hallway. If I'm initiating self-destruct, I want to be as close to an escape route as possible. They, that's why they say it's ten minutes. It gives you plenty of time. I don't know what your problem is. Oh, okay. Give me an extra ten minutes when I'm on the escape pod then. Because I'm not chancing it. No, no, this is perfect. Why make things convenient? So the whole end segment here, like I was saying, it makes sense that it gives us drawn-out scenes throughout the film, then slaps us with high-paced, quick-cut action at the end. But the action is pretty boring. Well, nothing happens! It's overly predictable, too. But they can't do it is the problem. Because if you're actually going to have action sequences with this xenomorph, you're going to have to show it in motion, responding yes. to this stuff, and you don't have the technology to do that. She flees to the escape shuttle, and Jonesy stuffed in that cat carrier is being thrown all over the fucking place. I don't know if you noticed that. Oh, no, I didn't. Oh, that cat gets messed up. Okay. Absolutely messed up. And when he, she pulls it out of the carrier when she's on the shuttle, like the thing is growling, obviously, but it should be attacking her. But yeah, she escapes, and then we get the predictable, quote, shock of the alien being aboard as well. <sighs> I have so many problems here, but I can tell by your size, so do you. So let's get into this. How does it know to go on to the escape pod? Did Why it hear it? the sirens and the countdown for the self destruct and be like, Oh, I'm a sentient creature that knows enough to say, get off of the ship into this exact spot, which is the escape pod? No! Why is it hiding? I don't know! It makes no sense. Or is it sleeping? Also, makes no sense. The only thing you could assume is that if it is smart enough, if it hides on the escape pod, it can hitchhike its way to more people. Yes. But that's not what we got of, like, that's not the impression we got of this being up until this point. No. But its hand falls down, and you think it's grabbing for Ripley, but she backs away, and it just stays put. What the fuck is happening? It's sleeping? That's what I was saying. Is it sleeping? Why is it hiding? What's going on? We get our first clear shot of the mouth within the mouth, which becomes iconic throughout the rest of the series. And Ripley puts on a spacesuit and opens the airlock. The creature freaks out. The sounds here, again, phenomenal. The creature grabs hold of the door, so she shoots it with some sort of grappling hook gun thing before setting it on fire with the ship's engines. We close with Ripley recording a journal entry of what transpired, and then she goes into stasis as well as Jonesy. It's his own little pod. And we roll credits. Not a movie to analyze, Sandro. No, no. So, does the cat always need its own stasis pod? Did it have its own stasis pod on the main ship? I was curious about that too. I can't tell you. I don't know. It must have, because who's feeding it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Can, this... can it just sleep at your feet like a... <laughs> Like an See, actual cavity. I was, cavity. I was curious about that too. Or is it like the fly transporter where you like come out of stasis half cat? I don't know. <laughs> there's too there's, there's too many questions. Yeah, and uh, this is royalty in horror sci-fi. This movie is iconic, but when you sit down and start analyzing things about it, it's riddled with holes. <laughs> it's um, riddled with holes. It's it's <laughs> rippled <laughs> with holes. Uh, you want to get into numbers? Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's do that. How much do you think it cost? Oh man, 1979. I have no idea. There's a lot going on here when you look at it. Yeah, and I'm trying to figure out like inflation and stuff. Like, how much would these practicals have cost back then? Probably an expensive movie for the 70s. 25 million? 11. 
What? Yep. Okay, that, that seems really, really low. It's pretty impressive, right? Yeah, for, for the 70s, I would have thought that this would be one of those where, like, at the time, it would have been a milestone for, like, spending, you know, because that just how inflation goes. How much do you think Star Wars was? What was the budget for Star Wars? Oh, come on, man. I don't know. I'm looking up now. I don't know either. Oh, okay. Uh, you want to take a guess while I'm looking it up? No. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Original trilogy, yes. Films. Star Wars released May 25th, 1977. With a budget of $11 million. There's no way. Keep in mind this is Wikipedia. Not exactly the most trustworthy source. Say, you didn't mix up the two, did you? No. Now, supposedly these two cost the exact same to make. So, how much do you think it made? Cause, or I will tell you right now, Wikipedia and IMDb have very conflicting numbers, uh, off by roughly $80 million. Oh, that close. Um, well, I feel like if it costs like $11 million, 100? Wikipedia is saying, I'm going to round up here, $185 million. Oh, wow. IMDb is saying $106 million. <sighs> I, did, did I get it? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Regardless, even, even if you assume the lower one, that's a, a heck of a return in 1979 if it cost yeah. you $11 million to make. Uh, as far as ratings go, um, this is up there, man. Uh, IMDb? 8.2. Very close. 8.5. Okay. Uh, percentage of positive reviews from critics on Rotten Tomatoes? 87. 93. <sighs> Audience score? 88. 94. Okay. <laughs> I'm surprised that it took them seven years to release a sequel to this. It took seven years? Yeah, it came out in 86. Wow, I would have thought that if it was, even from a financial standpoint, the return that it got, they would have been a little bit more quick to pump out a sequel. Yeah, it's also weird how it, like, the tones, of, like the genres of the films are completely different. Where this is more of a sci-fi horror like survival horror film aliens is just a straight up science fiction action film you've seen aliens right it's gonna be like the first one where i've seen i've seen the first three but i saw them a long time ago and i don't have the best recollection of them that's that's fine probably should go back and re revisit them now i would love to watch aliens if you're down yeah sure but uh, let me bring up Cody's awards here. Mm, yes, we have awards to do. So his least favorite character, okay. which I think we can all agree upon, is Lambert. <laughs> and his oh. reasoning is, I despise whiny, screaming, useless characters, and Lambert takes the cake on this one. <laughs> okay, Cody just earned a lot of respect in my books. <laughs> Yeah. The worst, right? Yeah. And, uh, and yours, Ben? Uh, Lambert. <laughs> For the exact same reason. Okay. You? Oh, I picked Lambert. I said it earlier that it was my award. <laughs> yeah. O honestly, I was unsure immediately, but as soon as we had that scene with Parker where she was just standing there, I'm like, oh, she's this character. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always one of them. Absolutely terrible, but mandatory, apparently. Yeah, apparently. Uh, what did Cody have for his favorite character? He has Jonesy. Kidding. Obviously, Ripley. She's the only one that wanted to follow the rules and not contaminate the ship, and she saved the cat. See? Okay. You? Uh, I went with Parker. Okay. I went from a different standpoint, not from the character so much as the entertainment value. And for me, Parker was the most entertainment I got out of this movie. Um, there was a good, like, a, just like a good 
personality there, a little bit more uplifting, uh, fun character, strong character. I enjoyed Parker more than anybody else. I also went with Parker, and it's because it's the most relatable character. Parker seemed like the most real human character in this movie. Um, funny most of the time, serious when it's being called for. Uh, you can see his connection with his best friend, Brett, seems completely organic, realistic. Um, you actually feel bad for him when he meets his fate. It's, he's just a great character. I loved him right from when they were like, we need to go investigate this. And he's like, no. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> no. <laughs> oh, good choice, man. Good choice. What did Cody have for his favorite or most memorable line? Uh, it's from Ash. Okay. And it is uh, when questioned about surviving the scenario. He says, I can't lie about your chances, but you have my sympathies. This line was delivered in such a cold and soulless way that it was perfect. Um, that's actually the line I picked, too. Uh, might as well say it's three for three. Yeah. It's the best line in the film, I think. Not just most memorable. I think it didn't have much competition. No. I think that this is a movie where, for even the people that really enjoy it, it's not because of the dialogue. I feel like most of the dialogue that takes place during this movie is very conversational and nothing really out of the ordinary. So there isn't going to be as much that stands out. Um, maybe the closest would be some things that mother types, but those aren't spoken. Yeah. Again, not to say that the dialogue is bad, but it's not made to have anything that's really revolutionary. Memorable scene? Yeah, what did Cody have? The chest bursting scene has to be picked. Probably one of the most iconic horror scenes, and the fact that the actors didn't know exactly what was going to happen makes this even more epic. <sighs> you? I, I went with the uh, radar following Dallas in the vents. Mm -hmm. I think I kind of already went into detail on how that was my favorite suspenseful moment in the movie. I thought that uh, part of it could have been those sound effects were just taking me back. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was just really well done until jazz hands. Yeah, jazz hands were terrible. <laughs> uh, I was going to pick the scene that doesn't exist in the version of the film that I saw, because that's the one that stays with me when I think of Alien, and that is the look of pain and terror on Dallas's face when Ripley finds him cocooned to the wall. You know, if I'd seen that version of the movie, that might have stood out to me because I'd have been like, oh, Dallas does show emotion. Yeah. Uh, but since that's not in the movie, I am going to have to go with examining Kane with the face hugger latched on. Just the way that the face hugger's tail tightens around his neck was so unnerving. Yeah. Yeah, and it's in response to any little movements that they do and things like that. Like, it's its defense mechanism. It's well done. It's that scene where, like, cops break into a hostage scenario and, like, a robber's got a gun to someone's head. It's like, you do anything and they could die. Here, it's the exact same thing. Like, you try to remove it and it will just kill Kane. Yeah, because at first I was like, well, why don't they just cut the tail part? But then it's like, well, the tail would be above the person, and that would mean that it would bleed through his neck. Yeah, it's so tense, and it's lose-lose. There's nothing you can do to come out on top with this scenario. Yeah. Like he, at this point, you know that Kane is done for. You just don't know when. Yeah, not bad. Yeah, quite good. All right, so final thoughts on Alien. Uh, I always enjoyed this film. Um, I think the second one is better, but when you, uh, fuck man, this is something I, I've discovered. Well, you've admitted to, uh, through a, a lot of the episodes we've done is we'll take some movies that we find really enjoyable. And when you start digging into them, you realize it's the worst thing you could do because this is an incredibly problematic film. But growing up, I was watching this countless times and loved it every single time. But when you start thinking about the the choices the characters make and the pacing of the film then you mix it with amazing sound design and fantastic sets it's 
it's really choppy. Um, I never would have thought Alien to be a popcorn film, but I think that's exactly what it should be. Because while it is effectively scary, it's not when you start breaking it down. So watch the movie and enjoy it. Don't study the movie. And that, that, cause that's just going to ruin it for you. So yes, having it directed by Ridley Scott and written by Dan O'Bannon, um, it, it is a phenomenal film to watch. It's, it's pretty weak in comparison to other movies in the same genre though. And I, I hate to say that because it, it's supposed to be such a good movie. And to most people, I'm sure they, they absolutely adore it. I know a lot of people who claim that Alien is their favorite movie of all time. And that's, that's awesome. I love Biodome. Doesn't mean it's great. It's a fun watch. If you've seen it and you liked it, you're going to keep watching it. If you haven't seen it, definitely give it a watch. I'm not saying don't watch the movie. I'm just saying don't expect a whole lot. What about you? I don't think it's something that I've kept too close to my chest, but I didn't enjoy this movie. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go out and say that it's a bad movie because by no means is this an objective statement, but for me, it was way too slow. And yes, when I very. think of Aliens... And this could be partially because of my recollection of what I remember from it. I remember watching like the Aliens versus Predators, the more recent Aliens, playing the video games. Having this very, very slow burning movie is just not what I want from this franchise. And by, by no means should anybody avoid this movie. Like, check it out. It's going to be one of those where you're either going to love it or hate it. Right? Like, it's, it's not because of the movie's quality, it's because of your tastes. And this one just didn't work for me simply because, like, honestly, it's, I hate to say it, like, it, it sounds so bad, but when I was watching this movie, there's a lot of times I was checking to see how much more the runtime was, because I was just getting done with it. I was right there with you when it comes to checking the runtime. It's just there, maybe you'll agree with me on this. There are some scenes in this movie that are so good that time just flies by. And then there are other scenes that just drag it to almost a standstill. And you just, you can't do that and have an effective story told. Not for me anyway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't think either of us expected this, this result. No, no, I was honestly very excited when i heard that this was going to be the movie and then it just didn't live up to my expectations um and that could be a fault of my own right but it's kind of difficult when the franchise steers so vastly in another direction after to maybe superimpose some of those expectations on this earlier entry and that's on me and that's yeah. fine um but yeah it just it just wasn't for me so yes, I said that this is more sci-fi horror and that the next one is more sci-fi action. Uh, just the other day, they released a trailer for Alien Romulus. Have you seen that yet? No. It takes place between Alien and Aliens. And I have to say, the trailer makes the film look terrifying. Hmm. I'm very excited for it. It's directed by Fede Alvarez, who did uh, um, Evil Dead 2013. So we know he can do horror really well. I'm, I'm very curious about this. I, I'm really looking forward to it. I might actually venture out to the theaters for it too. Oh, okay. Yeah, high hopes. Okay, so that was our thoughts on Alien. If you'd like to share your thoughts, hit us up on social media. We are on Twitter at BS Bargain Bin, Facebook.com slash BS Bargain Bin, BS Bargain .com, and YouTube.com slash at BS Bargain Bin. As always, t-shirts are available on our Redbubble uh, page. Links are available on our website. Ben. Yo. I don't think we've had our fill of aliens, dude. Oh, God. So for my pick, we're going to watch a movie with a lot more aliens. Is it aliens? No. You're going to hate me after this, but we're going to watch a movie with about three aliens that come down to Earth to try and pick up women in... Oh, God. Earth girls are easy. I'm going to show you something that's going to totally change your life completely forever. She's a brunette from Southern California. And he's not. I need romance. I need surprises. I 
UFO landed in my pool. They captured me. I fed them pop tarts, but you've got to cut their hair. What did you say? They may be from outer space. So, they can still be dates. I think we could just make them look more sort of human. Hey, come on, everybody. We're doing a makeover. But underneath, they're more than human. Wow, they're incredible. I could fix you up with some bodacious chips, just like that. I can't believe you're printing an alien in front of all these people. I'm going home with him. Are we limp and hard to manage? Wait a minute, are you, like, coming on to me? Her boyfriend's a doctor. I've never, ever been unfaithful to you. Whose treatment is totally alienating. Here comes Dr. Love. And her new love's an alien who's more than accommodating. Do you own your own home or do you rent it? Gina Davis, Julie Brown, and Jeff Goldblum in a film directed by Julian Temple and produced by Tony Garnett. I just don't want you to think Earth Girls are easy. Earth Girls are easy. Until next week, have a good one. All the best.